we're reducing costs by 20 to 30 percent. Our dream is to drive it down by 50 percent because someday that means that your rent, your mortgage payment could be half. That's that dream. That's that aha. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Thank you for listening to the show. My goal is for you to become a savvy investor by learning from some of the best operators and investors in the business. I'd like to hear from you. If you have questions you would like us to ask on the show, or if you have someone you would like me to interview, please let us know by emailing info at lifebridgecapital.com. We would love to hear from you. Please leave us a written rating and review. I would be grateful. Do not hesitate to let me know how we can best serve you at Life Bridge Capital. And now for an amazing interview with my friend, Lance Peterson. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Lance Peterson, co-founder and CEO of Passive Advantage, where we simplify the process of vetting real estate syndication deals for passive investors with our LP Deal Analyzer tool. I'm sitting in today for Whitney Sewell, founder of Life Bridge Capital. So our guest today is Mike Kading. He's the CEO of Norhart. Uh, Norhart is a company that designs, builds, and rents apartments in the Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area. They are transforming the way that this is done by incorporating technologies and techniques to improve the quality and reduce uh, cost for housing. They're committed to solving America's housing shortage and affordability crisis, and in doing so, they hope to improve the way we all live. So in today's episode, we discuss how Norhart is innovating the construction industry to tackle that housing affordability. They reduce construction costs by 20 to 30 percent and aim to drive it down by as much as 50 percent. They achieve all this by bringing all aspects of construction from architecture, design, all the major trades under one roof. We also discuss the importance of having you know, a clear vision and hiring only the best people. Hope you enjoy. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited to have you on the show. So we'll dive right into it. You know, I know you guys, you're based up in, you're in Minnesota, right? In the Twin Cities area. So you guys have been doing some really amazing things on the construction side, specific multifamily deals, you're really tackling housing affordability and just finding, you know, super innovative ways to bring costs down to, you know, construct these buildings and, you know, get them occupied and all those sorts of things. And so why don't you share a bit about, you know, how did how did you guys end up getting into this? And, and you know, was there a big aha that kind of led to that? I know, I mean, you've, you know, you've, you've figured out how to trim really big percentages off of the construction costs and the whole process. So maybe just share a bit with us, like, what's the origin story that got you guys into it that, you know, that kind of had that breakthrough where, you know, where obviously where others have, have struggled, they can't seem to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for us, as you kind of mentioned, we're reducing costs by 20 to 30 percent. Our dream is to drive it down by 50 percent because someday that means that your rent, your mortgage payment could be half. That's that dream. That's that aha. But it didn't start out that way, right? That was an evolution to figure that out, to understand where that world is. And in fact, I grew up in this industry. My parents Started the family business and growing up, uh, I was out there swinging a hammer, sweeping floors, picking up nails. In fact, our fa- family lost everything in those early years. My dad was actually kidnapped in Peru, separate crazy side story. But they started to work it back after all of that. But the one thing I knew when I went off to college was that I wanted nothing to do with the family business. And the reason that was is that I didn't want people to think it was given to me. So I really wrestled with my own ego. It was a small business at my t- at the time that my dad wanted me to join. But what I realized deep down is that I wanted to make some kind of meaningful, positive impact in the world. And I started to see that I could take this small business and grow it to something much larger to have that kind of impact. Jumped in, and my dad and I doubled the size of the company within the first few years of working together. It was amazing working with him. And then one day, completely unexpected, my dad passed away. One of the hardest moments of my life. And it's still fairly young, fresh out of college. Overnight, I took over this business. And looking back at all of that, That moment really solidified for me how short life 
really is. We only live about 10,000 weeks here on earth. And I often ask myself the question, how do I want to spend the minutes I have here on earth? I could care less about the money. We built over a $200 million company today. I care less about that. Like, who cares how many $100 bills they can shovel under your grave? What I really care about is what is the lasting impact that we can make? And that impact for me and our business, I think we can solve, is ultimately solving housing affordability in America. And that's our dream. Yeah, it's always good, you know, when you're building a business, you know, I consult with lots of guys and, you know, that's the thing. I'm like, you need a North Star, right? I mean, you, you just, and you might not in the early days know what that is, you know, but pick something, right? Anything, because you got to know where you're going. You know, you're going to have employees. People need to know, like, where, where's this thing heading? And, and that was the lesson I learned in my first business was it just, in the beginning, I didn't have that. I realized like, there just seems to be a bit more chaos than I wanted until one day you kind of bold enough to go out and say, this is what we're going to do. Like, this is where we're headed. And you just see immediately people get charged up. Like, oh, why didn't you say that? It's like, well, I was afraid to, right? Like, I, I didn't want to say something that maybe we couldn't make a reality, but it really does pull people along. So for- It's, for- it's so interesting, as you mentioned there, that, that issue, because we get so in our own minds, right? Our fear of sharing those ideas, presenting them to the world, and what will people actually think? And there's another fear too, which is, I don't know what my North Star is. And the reality is, I didn't quite know that either. It takes, it honestly, it takes years of kind of sharing ideas, getting beat down by the market, people telling you crazy, like tweaking, adjusting, forming, solidifying. And over time, that North Star becomes more and more clear. And the stronger, just as you mentioned, the stronger and clearer that is, the stronger and more powerfully you can move to truly solve it. Yeah. That's right. I mean, so when you, yeah, you say, I mean, that's where I, one of my favorite books, you know, early in my career was, you know, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and so he, he points out and also good to great by Jim Collins, you know, Jim Collins had the whole big, hairy, audacious goal. Right. And that's where it's, it's, and that's at the heart of it. So I was just noodling on like, what's, what's that big, hairy, audacious goal? What's that thing that we can, you know, point at? And and it does, and it takes, quarter over quarter over quarter, right? Like you're tweaking it and like, no, that's not quite right. That's not quite, that's not quite right. But the the beauty is that even if you're right on point, it just, at least it's moving people in the same direction. I think the absence of one means that they could be going any direction, right? And especially when they're looking to leaders like myself or you, they're looking to us, like, where are we going? Like, you know, you and your dad, like, where, where are we taking this thing? So it just ends up being really critical to build, build a lasting, great organization, you have to have one. And uh, I mean, so for you guys then, I mean, then that solving affordable, you know, affordability, obviously that's big, that's hairy, that's audacious, you know, that then the laser sites then be, went straight to, well, we've, we've got to be able to erect these things for far less than it's costing now. I mean, there's, you know, as anyone who's built anything or whatever can imagine, there's all sorts of inefficiency in the process. So what was like the first thing that you guys went after? It's like, was it material costs? Was it labor costs? Was it process driven? Was it, you know, what what was sort of that first thing that you began to lean into that started to, to move the needle? You know, my dad always had a way of driving down costs in the projects that we did, but his techniques were things like just sweat equity, just getting out there working late hours, long days, just pouring his heart into making that building a reality. And that certainly worked at sort of that small scale, but as soon as you get any bit larger than just a few people, it becomes very hard to make that a scalable reality. I remember early on, one of the first things that hit me in the face was we had a plumbing contractor. And this plumbing contractor had worked on a number of buildings with us, about the same size building every time. And he came to me and he said, Mike, I know it's about the same size building, but unfortunately, I am going to triple the cost of our bid. And I looked at him and said, dude, I, I don't have the money. I, I can't make that happen. So what do we do? I went out and bought a bunch of plumbing books, started exploring what we what it would look like if we did plumbing, because we found out all the other subcontractors in the market were just as expensive. We couldn't get anyone to do it less expensively. So why not do it ourselves? We ended up hiring a few um, just 
totally inexperienced people, as well as partnering with a master plumber to kind of help t- teach and train us. Super excited about it. We saw how we could do it for actually less than we were paying originally. Got into it, and boy, it was hard, right? We were actually worse off that first year doing it ourselves than we would have been doing the more expensive contract. But we learned. And then the next project got easier. The next project after that got easier. And eventually we became cheaper and less expensive at a higher quality than any of the other subcontractors we were working with. And it started to hit us and said, okay, dude, if we can do that with plumbing, could we do that with other things as well? And that's sort of what started this, this train of, dude, there's so much opportunity here. We can make a big improvement. Yeah, because it's funny you mentioned because one of the things I've been sharing a lot lately with with you know real estate sponsors is just saying you know I don't know if you realized it but when you decided to get into you know running a real estate you know investment company you actually started two businesses right and it's because you got one that goes and finds and manages real estate and you got another that has to raise equity capital those are two very different things. But you've got them both. And I always say it's like it's the equivalent of owning a trucking company, having to own an oil, your own oil refinery, like two very different business. No one would own a trucking company if you had to refine your own oil for the fuel in your, you know, in your fleet for your fleet. You know, so I'm like, you have to realize that. Like in your guys' case, what I hear you saying is like, yeah, you're real estate guys, you build stuff, but you're also now starting a plumbing company. And uh, and uh, like every time you add one of these things. It, it's ostensibly yes, it's it's interrelated. That's vertical integration, but those are it's like starting a whole new business, right? I mean, that's yeah. that's sort of what it is. Now you own a plumbing plumbing company who has one yeah, client. We, yeah, we went extremely deep. Yeah, so we brought in all the trades: plumbing, electrical, HVAC. We're the general contractor. We're the property manager. We're the owners of the properties. When we're done, we raise capital. But on top of that. We started precast concrete manufacturing, wall panel manufacturing. We have sourcing and supply chain. We have people in China and Mexico and elsewhere. Uh, we have engineering and architecture under one roof as well. I mean, just think about the architects and engineers. They're not incentivized to create the most efficient projects. What are they trying to do? They're trying to give you code compliant designs at the least amount of hours that they could possibly work. That maximizes their profit, but doesn't improve your project. So by bringing the the engineers and architects under one roof, our teams now go super deep. They will do dissertation level work on the adjoice that go in the ceiling to maximize what's the right flange width, thickness, shape of that joist to optimize the ease of installation, and the reduction of material costs. Our guys on site can regularly pick up the phone and say, hey, engineer, the way you designed this wall, it was terrible to install. You need to do better in the future. And they'll update our plans so that the next tower of that same project, and certainly the later projects, will have the better design in there. So really, really fundamentally, though, what you've got to do is you've got to build a team that can solve problems. Because there are like 10,000 problems that need to be solved in order to meaningfully improve that efficiency. And you have to put all of that under one roof, that whole system in place, so you can have that learning and growth you need to improve the system over time. You guys found a way when you're when you're hiring, given that, you know, with what we're discussing, it requires a lot of uh, a lot of human talent there and sourcing that talent. How do you guys go about hiring? Do you do you use sort of surveys or things to kind of find that, you know, problem solver gene, so to speak? Or, you know, how, how, have, how have you handled that? Yeah, it's extremely hard to hire people in this field over the last few years. And we struggled with it originally. And it, again, it's just another one of those problems we have to solve. So how do we solve it? Uh, we looked at this and said, well, a couple of things. First, we need to change our mindset. We had the mindset of like, let's hire average people, at average salary. That sounds good, right? Or maybe we'll try to reduce salaries and save some money. Does not work. That is the wrong approach. Yeah. Uh, instead, what we have found is that you need to hire the very best people. And when I say the best, I mean the truly mean the best. 
We will fly people in from other states to come work during the week and fly them home on the weekend. We have staff members. That one case, we have a staff member that in 2007, Steve Jobs announces the brand new iPhone. Steve Jobs walks off stage and our team member walks on that same stage following Steve Jobs' announcement. So it's that kind of caliber of people. But when you bring people like that together, they change things. They yeah. unlock doors for you that you didn't know could be unlocked. They solve these problems in ways that are just mind-blowing. But what most people think is they're afraid. They say to me, Mike, that sounds expensive. And it is when you look at it on a cost per person basis. But what most leaders fail to understand is that the best people outperform the average by two to five to even 10 times as much. So instead, if you're looking at it on a cost per unit produced, the best people are actually your least expensive. But back to your question, once we knew that we had to hire those best people, how do you actually find them? What we ended up doing is we ended up hiring an entire recruiting team, about a dozen or so recruiters in-house. Then we started, uh, we got software and systems in place where we started identifying all the people in our market with the skill sets we're looking for. And there's maybe a couple hundred thousand. And then we started building relationships with those people in advance so that as we had roles open up, we could pull from that talent pool to pull the very best people from our market in. We went, you know, maybe six, seven years ago of accepting most every person who applied for a job with our company, maybe 50% acceptance rate. Today, we accept 0.4%. Finding and bringing in the best people is no longer a problem for our company because we worked to solve it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it is. It's just true. I mean, and, and I suppose too, when they come in and they get to solve the hard problems, they're attracted to that. And they know that yeah. they've got colleagues that are, you know, the other A players. I mean, this is top grading 101, basically. It's just knowing that they're going to be surrounded by other top level talent. It just, it just perpetuates itself. They just know there's no, you know, they're not going to have to carry the whole weight on, you know, themselves. They know they're going to have equally intelligent person, you know, competent person on the other side that they're working with. That's fulfillment, right? Like that's how you love to show up to work every day. Absolutely. You know, I've seen, I've been through enough life now that I've seen what truly amazing teams look like. And there's a difference. And most people never really get to experience a team of every person being just freaking incredible in that group. Once you experience that, once you really understand what that looks like, you never want anything less than that kind of level. And it's so much fun to have that kind of group. Yeah, no, it's great. No, I love it. So for, for you guys then, I mean, do you have, do you only work in Minnesota? Is that where you do all of, like all your projects are in Minnesota or is that part of like the solve housing affordability is to eventually go to other markets or what are the barriers that would cause you from not being able to go into other markets? Yeah, right now we're primarily in Minnesota. Some of our manufacturing capabilities are in Wisconsin. Um, we are looking to expand into Texas next. For us though, the, the, the key thing we're looking at is the production engine, the manufacturing system, the infrastructure to build buildings at lower cost points. And that infrastructure is what we're most focused on. So we want to saturate a market, become the largest developer in that market before moving on to additional markets. Because again, we're building the system is really the focus. Yeah, yeah, it'd be, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, it, what I hear is like, you've got this capacity, you need to go as deep as you can until you hit rock bottom, you know, you're at bedrock, like, hey, there's nothing else, you know, this market can't sustain us building anything else, then think about expanding. So with with that said, I mean, right now, you know, with the, the debt markets the way they are, I mean, has it made it like what, what's the biggest challenge today for for you and the team to, to kind of accomplish your goal? I mean, knowing that there's a there, I mean, there's still a supply and demand imbalance, there's still an affordability, you know, issues, you know, what's What's holding you back? Like, what's the biggest constraint in the business? Yeah, normally, the biggest constraint is actually the rate at which we can hire the right people for the roles and building out that production engine. 
That is most of the time what it is for us. But with the rising capital markets, we've seen a a new problem that we've been working with. And that is when our costs were 20 or are 20 to 30% less than other developers, in the prior market, banks would typically lend at about 75% of a project, meaning that the bank would give us pretty much all, if not more than all of the financing we need to do projects. Now, I know you're in the space, there's HVCRE rules and other things you have to work through with the banks, but that's fundamentally how it works. And so we've been able to build that $200 million company off of totally our own money because we haven't had to bring much money to the table. Now, it changed. When interest rates went up, bank loan proceeds went down down to 55 or 65% of value. This created a gap for us from that 55 to the 75% of the capital stock. And so we've had to find ways to bridge that gap. One of the ways that we did it was opening up uh, Norhart Invest, which is a retail product offering investors up to 10% interest for money that they can lock in between six months and five years. And then we've also started going and raising capital more traditional routes as well. And that's been really interesting. We're starting to work on um, a variety of different capital funds and things of that nature. Uh, It's exciting because it's a skill set I've never really had to build before. But now that we're building it within our company, uh, it's going to make capital not ever a constraint, I don't think, for us in the long-term future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, what you guys are so innovative and, you know, what you do and you know, once yeah, once you get those relationships rolling, it seems like yeah, that constraint can can go away. Do you do you guys find? I mean, what would you the, the buildings that you are building? I mean, what's the average? I mean, how many how many units? How many you know are these like high end class A? Like, what's I mean? Do you I mean, given the affordability thing, what like how do you guys view that? Or is it we typically focus on larger buildings? Uh, three to four hundred units is our favorite sweet spot. Um, our latest project is definitely Class A. I, you know, I'm a bit biased here, but I would say it's in the top 10 properties or multifamily properties in the state of Minnesota. It's seven stories, uh, penthouse suites, restaurant, coffee shop, co-working space, tens of thousands of square feet of amenity space, brand new transit line stopping right at the front door, like on-floor parking. It's pretty incredible. But I would say more often than not, our sweet spot is the you know five stories of stick wood frame construction over one story of precast concrete, sort of that standard apartment building that you typically see. And uh, I mean, in terms of just your outlook on the state of Minnesota in general, and I mean, are there certain areas in the Twin Cities or, you know, up and coming suburbs or places that you, I mean, because you've got to go out and, I mean, as developers, right, you got to go source the land. I mean, these projects from the moment, like it, it could take from the time someone can live in the place you got to go back, what, five years, you know, like five years to make it a reality or so, I mean, are you looking at the path of progress? And I mean, I'm pretty familiar with the Twin Cities. That used to be the big city, you know, for me being from mine in North Dakota, (laughs) but, you know, so I know it keeps growing and growing and growing out there, but how do you guys deal with that? Like site selection and, you know, finding where you, you know, may want to build. Yeah. So we have a, a team in place that that's all I do is look at sites, have conversations with cities move uh, projects through the entitlement process. For us, our key focus is in driving down the cost of construction. So we're really thinking about that production engine more than anything else. So one of the key constraints for us is that we're within driving distance of our team, which limits us just to the Twin Cities right now. We're not out in you know further away cities like Rochester or um, Duluth or cities like that. But then within the Twin Cities, we're looking for places that have great commercial zoning, like lots of great amenity space nearby, good visibility. Um, we like things that are unique about the site, like the the new transit line going in front of our, literally stopping at the front door of our newest project. Uh, those are the sorts of things we look at. What's really interesting, though, in today's market is that because of the rise of interest rates, deals are just not penciling out the way they have before. I'm talking to developers every single day right now. They're just sitting on the sidelines because nothing seems to make sense. If you look at the data, uh, in the Twin Cities and actually nationwide as well, new apartment starts, so starting new construction, has dropped by something like 70 
or 80% in the past year. It's just fallen off a cliff. And so it's really interesting to see how this whole market will end up shaking out or if it'll just be stuck for years. And I suppose that's what's nice too about what you guys have gone after is, is the fact that, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like given your model, your ability to start and put a shovel in the ground is more likely to be able to take place 365 days a year, no matter the market's up or down. Exactly. Whereas most other developers, they have to pick when those when those windows open in construction makes sense because their costs are higher. Is that is that accurate? Exactly right. That gives us a lot more stability. When markets are down and other people are stopping construction, we're still able to move forward. We're having to pivot, right? We're having to raise capital where we didn't have to raise capital before. But our project fundamentals still make sense even in this kind of market because our costs are low enough. Yeah. Do you think some of the stuff you guys have put together, like does it does it translate over into building other types of stuff other than multifamily? Or is that where Absolutely. you guys are like, yeah. Absolutely. You know, we, we're not going to build other kinds of uh, construction right now uh, just because it's hard enough solving one type of construction. Yeah. But um, these ideas that we're employing are not new. In fact, if you look at other industries like manufacturing, over the past 60 years, industries like manufacturing have improved labor productivity by 760%. Construction during this time period has done nothing. So when we originally got started, we said, why not like stop looking at the construction industry? We don't know what we're doing. Let's go look at other industries and have conversations with them. We ended up uh, speaking at a conference and there was an executive there from Toyota that, that connected with me and said, dude, we're interested in working with you. And Toyota invented the world of lean manufacturing. They radically improved and reduced the cost of manufacturing products. And there's companies all over the world that look up to them and follow their model. So great, let's partner with Toyota. And other executives fly out here on a regular basis and we learn from them. We employ, we're employing technologies and techniques that they've used in manufacturing, but applying it to the world of construction. And so yeah. those can apply to anyone, not just ourselves. Yeah, that's every business. Yeah, I know. I That was when I got started as an entrepreneur, really got big into Toyota production system, mm -hmm. lean thing, lean manufacturing. You know, it's it's a mindset as much as anything. It's it's yeah. a culture. It's it's yes. about culture. It's about how people look at their work. Um, you know, and that's where, you know, it's eliminate waste. I mean, because waste is what it says. It's waste. Who wants waste? No one wants waste. Right. But um it it's yeah, it's it's hard to do. I mean, it's hard to. I mean, people aren't necessarily hardwired to think that way. It's a, it, it takes you have to. It's it's a cultural thing, you know, because everyone talks about all these tools or the things that Toyota do. But if the culture isn't there, it won't take. It won't hold. Everyone has to kind of have the right kind of mindset, which is which is challenging, and it requires lots of leadership. So for you guys, you know, was that hard or did you have to kind of like as you guys are catching on to this stuff like hey we want to be kind of revolutionaries here did did you find that that you had people that that just the more and deeper and deeper you got into it like they just kind of free up their future like you just don't have the mindset like we've got to bring in people that think differently absolutely uh yeah it is super hard honestly super super hard i mean elon musk talks about how it's hard to produce a car but it is 10 to 100 to 1,000 times harder to build a system that builds out a car. It's, I could not agree more. Yeah. So one of the, the challenges, yeah, we had to build up the right culture. There's a lot that goes into that. But you're right. Like, even with that, there was a point which we laid off like 70% of our staff. It's crazy because they were not the right fit. In fact, in the world of construction, you have a lot of people that think like, Dude, my granddad did it this way. My dad did it this way. And by golly, I'm doing it this way as well. They're stuck in this rut of thinking and this is the only way this kind of work is ever going to be done. When we hire people, we look for both having the right cultural fit and uh, the right skill set. And in the construction industry, it's really hard to find the match that covers both of them. Because the people with the right skill set in this industry don't have the right mindset to change it. 
And so we find a few amazing people that have that skill set, but we also work with a lot of people that are not even from construction that we bring in here to have the right mindset to change the game that can then also learn the skills of construction. So how do you view the the whole notion of, you know, kind of what what appears to me and you obviously know better than I do, it it just kind of the death of trade school or, you know, the fact that it just, you know, you got to go to four-year university. I mean, we just don't like the trades. It just seems like we're not creating enough people who want to get into the trades. Is that, is that fair? Absolutely. And that's probably why construction costs have risen so much is there's just a lack of labor supply to do the work. You know, a lot of people don't want to get their hands dirty out there in the mud and moving stuff around. It's it's hard work. Um, and yeah, the trades tend to attract, you know, the, the best and the brightest people go into technology or AI, all these exciting, like cutting edge things. They don't think to go into trade school to, to radically transform construction. But the, the interesting thing is, our housing is for a lot of people like 30% of your budget. And so, yeah, if you improve technology, yeah, your, your iPhone's gonna be a little nicer. That's great. We have a yeah. little smarter assistant. But if we get people into trades and kind of have a meaningful Im- impact on this, imagine someday if you could drive down the cost by 90%, like how much of an impact that would have in individual people's lives. If you look at apparel, it used to be that clothing was a large part of your expense or your budget every month as just a human. But, you know, a couple hundred years ago, they radically improved that. And now clothing for most of us is a de minimis expense. Like, I want people to be excited to go into trades to change this industry to make it housing a de minimis expense like other things. Yeah. So do you guys reach out to the local trade schools and source from there and and speak at the schools and... Have you have you taken it that far, or is that? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we've done whole days where we bring in like a uh, you know half a dozen team members that like build a, a whole booth and go to schools and stuff and encourage people to come to uh, come to our company. Um, we do less of that now. What we find is it's better just to proactively find the best people in the market rather than like source from that early on because a lot of those people are still in junior high school. Yeah, years before they actually could become an employee. And even so, right out of high school, right out of trade school, you still may not be the top of the market kind of person uh, yeah. that we're looking to join our company. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah, it just it's and I hope that starts to shift. It seems it seems like it it may be shifting a bit where where kids are the stigma is is sort of eroding, I guess would be probably a better way to put it. Like Hey, you know, it's for you, for your university isn't for everybody. Right. And that's okay. Cause I, I, I believe that I, and that's why I tell my kids and I got five of them. And that's why I tell them like, I, I not, I won't force you to, I mean, go to school or go to a four-year university. Like I want you to, you know, think about what brings you joy and what you want to do. And, and, and there's multiple paths to get there. Um, and you have well, to look what are you giving you this? Yeah. You can oftentimes make more money in the trades than you can with a four-year degree. Like there's a lot of our team members, uh, even at fairly low positions, are 100,000 a year plus positions, right? And people will get in the $200,000 a year. Like this is a lucrative field where you can make more money than many four-year degrees. Yeah, for, for sure, for sure. Cool. Well, this has been a great conversation, Mike. So where can people learn more about you and your company and connect with you guys? Yeah, the best place is to visit our website. That's norhart.com. That's N-O-R-H-A-R-T.com. A couple of interesting things. One thing I mentioned, which is a Norhart Invest, which you can earn 10% interest on your money. And the second thing is our podcast and show called Zero to Unicorn, where we follow the journey of people who are making a billion dollar impact. One of my favorite uh I uh, guess was Michael Uslan. He's the originator and the executive producer of Batman. In fact, he was able to eke out the movie rights with a few investors as a fairly young kid out of college. And it took him 10 years, 
10 years of people saying no, slamming the door in his face, saying that a dark and serious superhero movie, nobody wants to see that. He made it through that and eventually made the Batman movie a reality. Is really the founder of superhero movies the way we see them today. Amazing story. We have amazing guests. Check it out if you have time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mike. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.